Hello and welcome everyone to the Polity Primer series of Drishti IAS. My name is Pragya and today we are going to study about a very important topic of our Indian constitution. The title of our today's topic is Amendment of the Constitution. In this discussion we are going to see the amending the constitution. We will also see the constitutional provision in this regard. We will also understand the process of amendment. We will also see the restriction on parliament's power to amend and in the end we are going to see a practice question for your prelims examination and a practice question for your mains examination. Now let us proceed to understand the background of our today's topic or the context in which we are having this discussion today. The parliament has recently constituted a committee to examine the implementation of one nation one law concept and this committee is also going to examine whether a constitutional amendment is required in this regard and whether the constitutional amendment has to be ratified by the states. So in this discussion we are going to study about how our Indian constitution is amended, what do we mean by this term amendment and what do we understand by ratification by the states and what are the provisions in our Indian constitution that has to be uh, ratified by the state to have an amendment in them. So, let us proceed to understand how our Indian constitution is amended and what do we understand by this term amendment. So, if we talk about this term amendment in very simple sense, it means bringing about a change. So, what happened was when our Indian constitution was formed, our founding fathers were cognizant of the fact that the constitution cannot be a narrow document. It has to be a living dynamic document which can adapt itself from the change for the changing times. So, they were cognizant of this fact and that is why they added the amendment procedures in our constitution. As per the uh, opinion of our first prime minister Jawaharlal Nehru, if the constitution cannot change from time to time, it will narrow down the nation's growth. So, for uh, nation to grow, the constitution also has to grow with the growing nation and that is why the constitution has amendment procedures in them. This amendment process can either be a formal process, formal process or it can also be an informal process. So, we will see the formal process in our further slides and if we talk about what is an informal process to amend the constitution? It involves two devices that is the judicial interpretation and conventions established through uses. For example, if you talk about the appointments of higher judiciary in India, the constitution mentions the term consultation by the president of India, but the judiciary, the Supreme Court has interpreted this term consultation to mean concurrence by the president of India and this led to the evolution of the collegium system in India which is currently responsible for the appointment of judges in the higher judiciary. So, this was also a constitution amendment and though it was informal in nature, it did bring a change in the uh, constitution by defining what it is the procedure to be followed for appointing the judges in the higher judiciary. So, to summarize, amendment means to bring a change in the constitution. Various provisions can be added, they can be varied also and they can be repealed also. And the amendment procedure can be both formal amendment which we will study and informal amendment through judicial interpretations or by using the conventions which have been established by users. Now, let us see the constitutional provision in this regard and where has it been given the amending power of the parliament of the constitution. So, article 368 and which is mentioned in part 20 of our Indian constitution gives the power or to the parliament to amend the constitution. It states about three things that the parliament can either add the provisions repeal the provisions or it can vary the provisions of our Indian constitution and 
the amending power has been specifically given by our Indian constitution under article 368 to the parliament. Then the interpretation of this provision is the focal point of tussle between the parliament and the judiciary since we got independence. Like since 1951, the amendment of this article, the interpretation of this article has been in a constant controversy between the parliament and the judiciary. Then the constituent assembly debated extensively on whether the constitution should be flexible or rigid. So, so when this amendment procedure was being considered by our constituent assembly, they debated extensively on the fact that whether the amendment procedure should be a flexible procedure or a rigid flex uh, procedure. Whether our Indian constitution should be flexible in nature or rigid in nature. If we talk about flexible constitutions, the most famous flexible constitution is the British constitution. How is the British constitution amended? The parliament can simply pass an ordinary legislation and can amend the constitution. So, it is this easy to amend the British constitution. Parliament passing a law in the same manner in which it would pass an ordinary legislation. So, as I was discussing this before also that the parliament in England passes a simple law such as an ordinary leg legislation and the constitution stands amended. And But this is not the case with the US constitution. US constitution is very rigid to amend. And uh, it cannot be amended without the ratification of at least three-fourths of the individual states. So, to amend the US constitution, you require the ratification by three-fourths of the individual states. That is why we say it is very rigid to amend the US constitution. But if we talk about our Indian constitution, it is both flexible sometimes to amend and rigid. So, it is a mixture of both flexible and rigid. Some provisions can be amended by simple majority. On the other hand, some provisions are require the ratification by the state. Now, let us see the process of amending of Indian constitution. So, to amend an Indian constitution, a bill has to be originated. A constitutional amendment bill has to be originated in either house of the parliament. A stark thing to note here is that the power of amendment is given to the parliament. That means the bill cannot originate in the state legislatures because the state legislatures do not have a power to amend the constitution. Then the each house must pass the bill separately. So this means that there is no provision of joint settings as we have studied in the case of financial bills. So for a constitutional amendment bill, each house has to pass the bill separately. In case of a disagreement between the two houses, there is no provision for holding a joint sitting of the two houses for the purpose of deliberation and passage of the bill. So, I was discussing this before also that the provision for joint sitting of both the houses which is mentioned in our article 108 of the Indian constitution is not available in the case of constitutional amendment bill. Then when the each house both passes the bill, uh, constitutional amendment bill, the bill is then sent to the assent to the president to give his assent and here also the president is not empowered to withhold his assent or to deny his assent or to send the bill back for reconsideration to the houses. This means when a constitutional amendment bill reaches the president for giving his assent, he is not empowered to withhold his assent and this has been added to our Indian constitution by the 42nd amendment act. 42nd constitutional amendment act. That the president in this case is not empowered to withhold his assent or send the bill back for reconsideration to the houses. So, this was all about the procedure of our Indian constitution of amendment uh, and this procedure is often categorized because it gives immense power in the hands of the parliament. The parliament is the sole authority to amend our Indian constitution. Then there is no provision for joint sitting of both the houses. If one house is passes it and if it is passed in the Rajya Sabha as well, it becomes a law. And this, uh, this, this is what happens that 
when a ruling party has a majority in both the houses of the parliament it simply passes the bill without any discussion or without any paying heed to any uh, suggestions given by the uh, opposition and uh, this makes the passage of the bills very easier thirdly the constitutional amendment bill can be passed as an ordinary legislature this is not a separate process it is counted in the legislative process of the parliament so this is some of the criticism against the procedure of our indian constitution amendment of our indian constitution now let us see the majority the kinds of majority that is required to amend the indian constitution so three kinds of majority has been uh, talked about for the process of amendment these are first is the simple majority then there is special majority and then there is ratification by states let us study each of them one by one so we'll be firstly talking about the concept of simple majority to understand this concept in simple terms imagine hypothetically that parliament is a classroom and there are 100 students in the class so what do we understand by this quorum or simple majority that 50% of the members who are present and voting plus one so 50% plus 1 and this is known as simple majority. So, if 50% of the members plus 1 member votes in the favor of the constitutional uh, amendment, it becomes, uh, it is passed through simple majority. So, this is the concept of simple majority. Several provisions of the constitution can be amended by the simple legislative process adopted in passing any ordinary legislation in the parliament. So, most of the ordinary legislation in the parliament are passed through simple majority. This is done through a majority of those present and voting and does not require quorum. So, this is very important that this simple majority is counted only on those members who are present and voting and this does not count the quorum that is the mandatory quorum required for the functioning of the house. This is not counted in this case. So, for example, this also does not take into account the vac vacation of seats and the members who are absent. So, we were imagining parliament as a class and if uh, out of the 100 members who are present, if 50% plus 1 member votes in the favor, then it is considered to be passed by a simple majority. No mandatory quorum is required in this case. Throughout the constitution, such provisions are excluded from the purview of article 368, creating a specific category. So, we have noticed in our Indian constitution that many provisions mention this term that no uh, law made under, no change made under this provision shall be constituted as a constitutional amendment for the purposes of article 368 and that is why they create a special category for themselves because we see many uh, provisions in our Indian constitution which mention this phase that means they can be amended through simple majority. Let us have a look at some of these provisions of our Indian constitution. So, the first provision is formation of new states and alteration of areas, boundaries or names of existing states. So, this is mentioned in article 4. So, to amend article 4, you just require a simple majority. Then, abolition or creation of legislative councils in the state. So, the states in India, it is not mandatory for them to have a bicameral legislation. They can decide that uh, whether they want to have a uh, council of states or not. And if they decide that they want to have a legislative council, that is the Vidhan Sabha and the Vidhan Parishad. So, if they want to have a Vidhan Parishad for their state, they can ask the center and the bill in this regard can be passed by a simple majority. Then use of official language, citizenship acquisition and termination of citizenship also requires a simple majority. Then there are other provisions as well such as elections to the parliament and state legislatures, the fifth C schedule which talks about the administration of scheduled areas and scheduled tribes. Then there is sixth schedule which is administration of the tribal areas. So, to amend all of these provisions in our Indian constitution, we just require a simple majority. Now, let us study about the special majority. 
which is mentioned in article 368. So, if I try to explain this special majority in very simple terms, we are again considering parliament hypothetically as a class. So, what do we understand by this term special majority? So, in their class, supposedly there are 100 members. Okay. And this constitutional amendment bill is presented to this class. So, what happens is, apart from the 50% members who are voting in this favor, two, it should receive a minimum of two-third members should be voting in favor of it. So, let us uh, make this more clear that you see that there is a requirement of passing in each subject. That is, there is an aggregate as well as you have to score a basic minimum marks as well. So, two-third members should be uh, voting in the favor as well as the 50% majority members should also vote in its favor and this is known as special majority. So, this is simple majority. Majority plus two-third members should also vote in its favor and then it will be special majority. For amending provisions that do not fall under the first category of Article 368, that is the category of simple majority, requires the amendment bill is passed in both the houses of parliament by a majority of not less than two-thirds of the members present and voting. All provisions that do not require ratification by states and those that come directly under the purview of Article 368 can be amended by a special majority. So, where is this special majority mentioned in Article 368? It is mentioned in Article 368 Clause 2. So, it requires the minimum uh, number of two-thirds to be achieved apart from achieving a majority. So, this is all about the special majorities and the fundamental rights and the directives principles of state policies in our Indian constitution require a special majority for being amended. Now, let us discuss what is ratification by states and what are the provisions that require the ratifications by the states. So, provisions related to federal structure of polity. So, if we want to, uh, you know, add, repeal or uh, vary our federal structure of polity, then we require the ratification by the state. That means, half of the states should agree that, okay, this provision should be amended. There is no time limit within which the states should give their consent to the bill. So, this is also a point of criticism of the amendment procedure that there is no time limit for the state to give their assent and if once they give their assent that once they consent that okay this provision should be amended, they cannot withdraw their consent. The constitution is completely silent upon the topic of withdrawal of consent by the states and this is a point of uh, criticism of the amendment procedure as well. Then, while the simple majority is not specifically listed under Article 368, the provisions which require the ratification by the states are specifically listed in Article 368 and these are Articles 54 and 55 which talks about the election of the President of India. Then there is Article 73 and 162, Executive Power of the Union and the States. Then there are Articles 124 to 147 and 214 to 231, Powers of the Supreme Court and the High Courts. Then Articles 245 to 255 which talk about scheme of distribution of legislative, taxing and administrative power between the Union and the States. Then there is Articles 80 to 82 which talks about representation of the States in the Parliament and Article 368 itself. So, to amend all of these articles, to bring a change or repeal something or to vary something in these articles, a ratification by half of these states is required. The 99th Constitutional Amendment Act of 2014, which brought the NJAC, 
that is the national judicial appointment commission was ratified by 16 states Though it was later struck down as unconstitutional by our Supreme Court, but it had the willpower of all the, apart from the parliament of 16 states. That means 16 states were in favor of establishing a national judicial account appointment commission. Then there is 120th Constitutional Amendment Act, which brought the GST regime in India. This constitutional amendment act was ratified by 23 states. So, to amend some of the provisions of our Indian constitution, ratification by the states is also required. One of the uh, criticism of this uh, amendment procedure is that uh, most of the uh, provisions of our Indian constitution can be amended by parliament as if there were some ordinary legislation and states do not play a role in them. Only some of the important provisions of our Indian constitution require a ratification by the states. So, this is also one of the criticism of the amendment procedure that states do not have much say in the amendment procedure and the amendment power lies completely in the hands of the parliament. So, this was all about the process of amendment in our Indian constitution and what are the provisions which can be amended by simple majority, special majority and the provisions which require the ratification of the states to amend. Now, let us see the restriction on this parliament's power to amend. The parliament's amending power is not absolute. The parliament in exercise of its amending powers cannot alter or change the basic structure of our Indian constitution. So, those provisions which form the part of the basic structure of our Indian constitution cannot be amended by the parliament and this has been laid down by our Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Keshwanand Bharti versus State of Kerala and I have discussed this elaborately in my basic structure lecture that the parliament cannot amend the basic structure provisions. Though it is still not clear that which of the provisions are placed in the basic structure of our Indian constitution, they are interpreted time and again by our judiciary, but provisions, important provisions that are included in this doctrine are uh, values enshrined in the preamble like secularism, equality, etc. Then federalism, separation of power, independence of judiciary, judicial review, rule of law, etc. So, these all fall under the basic structure doctrine and these are those principles which forms the bedrock of our Indian constitution and that is why the parliament pa amending powers do not extend to amend them. The parliament is restricted to amend them. And we were discussing previously in this lecture that there is a constant tussle between the parliament and the judiciary about the interpretation of article 368. The parliament states that now the judiciary will try to undermine the parliament and place most of the uh, provisions of our Indian constitution as the basic structure. So, the parliament will not have the power to amend them. But this should not happen because parliament is a democratically elected government and the judiciary should not undermine the parliament. On the other hand, the judiciary says that by evolving the doctrine of basic structure, we are uh, trying to have a check and balance on the unrestricted use of the power of the parliament. And that is why the interpretation of uh, article 368 remains as a focal point of tussle between the parliament and the judiciary. And we have discussed this elaborately in our basic structure lecture. So, with this we come to a conclusion of our today's discussion. We have seen that how our Indian constitution is amended. We have also seen that the provisions can be amended by either simple or special or ratification by states and we have also discussed that the parliament is not empowered to alter the basic structure of the Indian constitution. Now, let us see a practice question for your prelims examination. So, the question is and this is a previous year question which was asked in 2013. Consider the following statements. Your statement number one is an amendment to the constitution of India can be initiated by an introduction of a bill in the Lok Sabha only. 
your second statement is if such an amendment seeks to make changes in the federal character of the constitution the amendment also requires to be ratified by the legislature of all the states of india kindly drop your answer in the comment box below your options are option a is one only option b is two only option 3 is both one and two and option d is neither one nor two so kindly drop your answer in the comment box below now let us discuss a practice question for your mains examination critically evaluate the significance of the amendment provisions in the indian constitution so uh, what can be the approach you can follow to write this answer is in introduction you will mention about the amendment procedure as i was discussing in our lecture today then you will also state that there can be both formal procedure and an informal procedure which is evolved through judicial interpretations and conventions you will also discuss that each house has to pass this bill uh, separately you will also mention that the president cannot withdraw or withhold his assent in this regard when he has received a constitutional amendment bill for his assent you will also discuss the kinds of majority that is required to pass the constitutional amendment bill and you will also give the example of the provisions as i have discussed then you will state that the parliament uh, power to amend is not uh, absolute it cannot alter the basic structure doctrine as has been evolved in the keshwanan bharti case so you can uh, conclude by saying that amendment is an important procedure because it helps to maintain the dynamic character of our indian constitution you can also state that the doctrine of basic structure has helped to preserve the foundational stones of our indian constitution so you can conclude this by saying that the parliament has the power to amend but this parliament uh, this power is not absolute in nature so this is the approach you can follow while writing this main answer question I hope this session was insightful for you. If you have any feedback regarding this session, kindly drop it in the comment box below. If you find the today's discussion helpful, kindly like the video and subscribe to our channel for more such updates. Thank you.